Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Center for Global Development. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation today with uh, Mark Lowcock, uh, who's a distinguished uh, fellow here at uh, CGD. And of course, Mark has a very long and distinguished career in development. Uh, last four years uh, of his official role was as the Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs of the UN. And that's what he talks about in his book, uh, the new book, let me show it to you. This is his book that's just been released. And we're going to listen to Mark talk about his lessons from that period and, and really to reflect on uh, how he sees the agenda going forward. So Mark, welcome. It's uh, great to have this chance to talk to you. Uh, you were there behind the scenes, at the scenes, uh, trying to coordinate a humanitarian response. Uh, and one, I wanted to sort of first of all start off by listening to uh, you talk a bit about your main takeaways from that period. But just to frame it, um, it's interesting that in the time that you were there and, and over the last five years, in many ways, the agenda for the humanitarian system has just grown so much. The uh, number of people that are impacted uh, by humanitarian crises is much larger. The nature of these crises has become more diverse. Uh, it's not just uh, floods or droughts, but uh, conflict, uh, now climate change. And the challenge facing the agencies. They seem to be running faster and faster, but not really able to, to keep up with the growing uh, demands on them. So uh, you've had a chance to be right in the middle of all of this. Uh, and it would be great to just hear, first of all, what your main takeaways were from this. Well, thank you, Masood. And it's great to have this opportunity to talk to you and hopefully get some discussion going with everyone um, who's who's watching the conversation today. Um, let me just start by saying uh, how grateful I am to everybody at CGD for help in producing the book. Um, you know, we you, you'll all make your own minds up about the words on the pages, but I do I do hope everyone will agree that um, it's a it's a nicely produced volume, and that's not to do with me. That's to do with lots of colleagues in CGD. Especially, I want to thank um, Emily Scharbacher, who was the editor and managed the production process. Thank you, Emily, because I think it's come out very nicely. So, three takeaways, um, Masood. You asked me to distill. I mean, the first thing it is important to say is that humanitarian agencies basically do a good job in helping people around the world caught up in crises. They provide help to more than 100 million people a year of the agencies I was supporting through my role as a coordinator at the UN. And they certainly um, save millions of lives a year. And for all the problems we're going to talk about, things would be much worse without that work. And people display a lot of professionalism, but also courage and commitment in doing that work. And, and many of them, unfortunately, lose their lives in doing that work because of the nature of crises. The second thing, though, is, as you alluded to just there, over recent years, the humanitarian agencies have been increasingly overwhelmed. There's been a huge explosion of humanitarian need, and you talked about some of the reasons for that. But what's been dealt with is not the causes of that explosion in need, but the symptoms. And while you keep responding to cause uh, just symptoms and not not causes, things are going to keep getting worse. And so the agencies um, are basically overwhelmed at the moment. And one of the main things I'm trying to do in the book is set out sort of a hundred practical things the agencies could do that are achievable, even in today's complicated geopolitical environment, that would enable them to cope <clears throat> a bit better. That's why I've, you know, the subtitle is that it's a, it's a manifesto for saving lives in dire times. The third takeaway, though, that I be you know, I felt increasingly um, passionately about really the longer I was in this job at the UN. And um, maybe it's worth saying, since the job was created in 1991, I had 12 predecessors. I was the lucky 13th <laughs> order of the post. And I spoke to almost all my predecessors and they all explained to me how the time they were doing the job was the hardest time of all to do it. And 
Um, uh, but actually, I, I think the time I was doing it was the hardest time of all because there was this huge explosion in need. But the thing that I, I did feel increasingly frustrated about and, and thought was a real issue was that the way the humanitarian system works, that most of the important dialogue and decisions are made between the agencies doing the work and the people funding them. And the people who they're trying to help, who should be at the heart of the conversation, are often not in the conversation at all. And um, that has a number of deleterious consequences. And you and I have talked about that um, before. And so one of the things I wanted to do in the book was tell a lot of the personal stories of people I met in 50 countries around the world in these crises to convey the fact that people caught up in crises are just the same as the rest of us. They have the same hopes, anxieties, fears, struggles, desires for their children and so on. But life's lottery has been crueler to them than to us and it would be the right thing to do to give people caught up in crises a bigger voice in the help they get and how crises are dealt with and that's why i've dedicated the book to the victims and the survivors thank you thank you very much uh, mark so we'll come back to sort of each of those points or at least the second two um you know the fact that uh, we don't deal with the causes and, and that sort of is basically a catching up process uh, it's dealing with the symptoms and then this issue of how to put uh, people who are impacted by humanitarian crises at the center or much more at the center of decision making about the way in which the system operates um maybe the first of those is something we could go into now because in some ways, the humanitarian system has really never dealt with the with the causes. It's, it's it was set up to deal with the consequences, and uh, there are some people who would argue, well, that's really what sets it apart. You know, it's about dealing with the consequences. It's apolitical. It's neutral in that sense. But wh why do you think the causes have worsened in a way that? has resulted today in in this explosion in the in the symptoms in you know, what what is driving that and and i think you and i were talking at an earlier uh meeting about how this year perhaps after 10 years we might again see mass deaths from famine uh which is something we haven't seen for 10 years and and some of it is attributable to the impact of the spillovers from the the war in ukraine but but this was happening before. Uh, there were so. What's your take on why do things get keep getting worse? Well, um, of course, for most of human history, the 150,000 years human beings have walked the planet, the kind of suffering and uh, tragedy that we're dealing with in humanitarian crises has been routine and common everywhere in every country around the. Well, famines were ubiquitous around the world uh, for most of human history. But what's happened over the last 60 years is a remarkable um, change. Most countries have developed enormously. When I was born exactly 60 years ago, the majority of human beings lived in extreme poverty. That's come down and down and down and down. People live longer. They're, they're less likely to watch their kids die in childhood. They're more likely to, to send their kids to school and so on. So that it's not more than 50% now in poverty, it's it's less than 10%. And of course, the pandemic has put that under stress and we may be going backwards a bit. But, but what's happened is progress has stalled. And um, and that's, it, it, it's set, above all, it's stalled in the bottom group of countries, 30 or 40 countries, largely in Africa or parts of the Middle East, which haven't enjoyed the sustained progress most of the rest of the world has. And those are the places where humanitarian suffering has been concentrated. And what we've seen over the last 10 years is three big things dragging those countries down. The first is conflict and a failure to resolve and um, deal with conflict and prevent it. Witness the appalling you know, tragedy of the civil war in Syria, witness what's happened in Yemen, look now at what's happening in the Sahel. And I've got chapters in the book about all of those things. The second big driver of growing humanitarian need, though, I think is the um, unfolding impact of climate change. More storms, more droughts. You talked just now about um, famines. We 
got quite close to the point of eradicating famine from the human condition, just one significant one in the course of this century when a quarter of a million people lost their lives in Somalia. But now, um, because of the combination of things that have gone on before um, the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, but also the effect of the invasion, we are, we are threatened with multiple famines across the world now. And climate change is a driver in that, um, for example, in the Horn of Africa. But then the third, the third big driver is um, COVID and other diseases. COVID dragged down the economies of many of the most vulnerable, poorest countries so that people who were just about um, managing have been dragged down into that extreme poverty level. And those are the people who become vulnerable in humanitarian crisis, the people who might not survive at all. So it's those three big things um, that have led to this explosion in need. How do we fix that problem? Well, the only way to fix it actually is to get those countries back on a, a path of development like most of the rest of the world has enjoyed over the last 60 years. There's no other no other way out of this challenge than, than to help countries develop. Right. And, and of course, that takes one into a whole discussion about, which you don't go into in this book, but which is about how development agencies and development cooperation supports countries that are going through a period of fragility or that are generally fragile conditions where you don't have the sort of governance structures, the policy frameworks aren't there. And often the way in which international development cooperation is structured, those handicaps become barriers for engagement rather than reasons to engage. And, and that's something that I think is sort of merits a separate conversation. Um, but perhaps just a little diversion on the sort of link between development uh, assistance and humanitarian assistance. And for at least a decade, I remember we've been talking about the, the need to bring these two streams of international uh, cooperation closer together in ways that recognize that many refugees and other people impacted by humanitarian crisis will be there in that current in their current state for many years to come and therefore they need more than immediate humanitarian assistance and the development agencies have become much more involved in providing financial support uh, to countries uh, you talk a bit about that book how far do you think that process has come do you see this as as sort of largely done now or is it a still early stages if work in progress well, you know, the, the international development system was set up in the wake of the Second World War, as I guess people watching us will recall and understand. And the focus was on trying to lift large numbers of countries out of the poverty that they were in at that point, which I talked about a bit earlier. And what's happened is that that system, the bilateral agencies, many of the multilateral agencies like the UN, the international financial institutions have been quite successful actually in helping most countries around the world move a significant way forward. But what has not happened, and I think should have happened, is that as countries were moving forward, um, the, the rate at which they've been graduating themselves from help from those agencies has been too slow. So those agencies are of their total level of effort are spending too much time on countries which frankly only need them to a marginal degree and they haven't retooled themselves those agencies to deal better with the countries who are stuck and some of the products some of the processes the people um, some of the um, knowledge we need on how you can be effective in um, some of these very fragile places hasn't been developed and there's a huge agenda there um, and I think that that ought really to be there ought to be a lot more activity and um, that'd be something I'd be interested in trying to contribute to over the next um, few years. I think that should be the heart of the work over the next generation of, of the international development system, those very fragile places. The, the divide that you rightly talk about, and I talk about in the book, between the humanitarian and development system has some understandable origins. Humanitarian assistance as a 
history of needing to be provided in an independent, impartial, neutral way, often outside the control of the state in which the activity is taking place, because the state is too often a party to the underlying reason why there is a, a crisis. But that um, that has also created some un, unwelcome, I think, divisions between development effort and humanitarian effort. And there are some cultural divides between uh, those two systems. The humanitarian system, I talk about this in the book, possibly with a, you know, a, a little bit edgier way than some people would maybe appreciate, which is the that the humanitarian system can come across as a bit holier than thou, a little bit riven by a hero complex, very focused on the here and now, we're saving lives, don't get in the way. The development system can come across as a bit reflective, having long um, time um, lags between identifying an issue and doing something about it, um, worrying a lot about sustainability. And those cultures bump into each other quite a bit. Now, when I was at the UN with Akim Steiner, who was the head of the UN Development Programme, we, we spent two years at the beginning of my tenure trying to get those whole systems working together better because actually their objectives for the two systems are basically the same. What Unfortunately, what happened was as time passed in my last two years or so um, at the UN, we were just overwhelmed by more and more crises. And the humanitarian system was basically unable to engage on that forward looking um, joining up agenda, which in, in less press circumstances, it would be desirable to do. <clears throat> and, I, you know, there wasn't really an alternative to that because absent the firefighting the humanitarian agencies were doing, there would have been a much higher death toll in some of these big crises. Somehow what we need to do is create greater bandwidth for both the humanitarian and the development systems and build a development system that's better able to deal with the underlying causes of problems that the humanitarian agencies are dealing with the symptoms of. Right. And so what I just say is sort of, you know, build this broader bandwidth to be able to to bring the two together the other issue which i'm more and more focused on is the sort of sustaining interest and follow through and uh, you know if you look at it uh, the funding of the humanitarian system a lot of it is through appeals that the un puts out the appeals are done uh, case by case, you know, so every time there's a crisis, you come up with an appeal and you try and get funding for it. And I think the total volume of appeals, uh, because of the this explosion in need, has has also doubled to some forty billion or something. Um, but I look at sort of the results of the appeals, and you can almost trace a wave of political interest and support in the crisis of the moment that that people are focused on funding. And right now, for example, for good and very valid reasons, everyone's focused on, on the issue of the humanitarian impact of the invasion of Ukraine. A few months ago, people were very focused on the uh, humanitarian crisis and, and the sort of impending food insecurity, hunger, and, and, and starvation in Afghanistan. Same time, there's you know, ongoing crises in, in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. And yet, when you look at the extent to which UN appeals in these different crises are getting funded, you see big differences. And, and I wanted to get a little bit of your sense on two things. One, so how, how does one deal with this attention deficit disorder, this sort of short-term focus in, in this? Because these things do need sustained support. And second, how can one get away from a funding mechanism where instead of funding each crisis, as it were, you know, the, there is more of a funding of a system which allows you to allocate funds across uh, to where they can, they're most needed at any given time? Yes. So... Yeah, that's a crucial question. And there's a number of things that we could talk about in in dealing with it. I mean, the first thing is, um, 
it's possible to have a much more anticipatory approach to these crises. At the moment, we have a very reactive one where activity is generated mostly when um, everybody sees a starving child on the TV screen. I talk a lot in the book about how we can move to a much more anticipatory approach using insurance mechanisms, using contingency financing mechanisms, recognizing also that most of the crises humanitarian agencies are dealing with are quite protracted be going on for a long time. And it's much more efficient and effective to um, allocate money to dealing with them over several years rather than come back year after year after year. That's a very inefficient way of um, operating. So that that's a, a first set of issues. A second set of issues arises from the um, way in which the system is financed. Humanitarian action is entirely financed by voluntary contributions. Uh, unlike, for example, how the UN pays its overall bills or unlike how um, peacekeeping operations of the UN are paid for, or for that matter, unlike how organisations like the World Bank of Finance, where there's a sort of burden sharing um, approach. And one of the proposals I made in the book is we should at least extend a, to a degree um, some collective financing of some humanitarian action. The UN has a thing called the Central Emergency Response Fund. When I it was it was set up after the tsunami in two thousand and four, when I started my job, we were raising about four hundred and fifty million dollars to eight hundred and fifty, and it's come down a bit since then, unfortunately, because of the regrettable cuts to the British humanitarian aid system. But what I what I have suggested is at least for that little bit of the system, why don't we try to get it funded on on the same basis that peacekeeping is funded? And then if there's a pot of money, um, uh, say a billion dollars available every year, when you see a new problem, you can kickstart a response and you can do a bit more anticipatory financing. That would make a that would really make quite a big difference. Now, coming on to the attention deficit shifting priorities issue, um, I entirely agree with you. You're obviously entirely right. And a rather tragic thing we've seen in Ukraine in the first two months of Ukraine is the aid agencies financiers asking the aid agencies to divert money from places like Afghanistan and Yemen and Somalia where they were keeping millions of people who were close to the edge alive to help out in Ukraine. Actually although the aid agencies have an important role in Ukraine the government of Ukraine's own systems their pension system their public um salaries and their safety net system are holding up pretty well and a smarter strategy for the wider world is to support those systems as for example the um, Biden administration have, have, have done and as the EU have done. Um, that would be a better strategy rather than redirecting the aid agencies to Ukraine. Now in the last month or so I think we've seen a recognition that what was done in the first month or so was not the right approach and people are increasingly aware of this huge global food crisis, probably the worst global food crisis we've had for decades. And the fact that the victims of that are in places where there are long running humanitarian crises. And so people have started to say, well, no, we better not divert resources away from them. In fact, what we better do is add to the resources available to them. And the recent decision by again, by the Biden administration to put $5 billion extra into their humanitarian response account, I think was a really uh, was a really good thing to do. And I'm hoping that when the G7 meet um, in Bavaria later this month, other countries will step up to the plate and do the same thing. Right. I mean, in fact, food prices having gone up, it's not just countries that are having to pay more, but also the international agency, the World Food Programme and others all need extra funding, both because the volumes required are larger, but also because every tonne of wheat is going to cost them you know, 30, 50% more. So the there is a double whammy that they're coping with. So the, you need the extra, without the extra funding, you're actually cutting back on the amount of assistance. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and exactly. I think people, I, yeah. I mean, in fact, there's a there's a third element. There's, a, if you like, a triple whammy because uh, the World Food Programme are one of the biggest customers of Ukrainian grain. Yeah. So they now are having to go elsewhere into the market, as you say, to pay higher prices but to reorganize all their procurement and shipping and the insurance and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, so there's multiple ways in which um, 
the food crisis is harder to deal with because of the importance in grain markets of Ukraine and Russia previously. Right. Should we talk a little bit, coming back now to the sort of functioning of the humanitarian system? And you mentioned, you know, your third takeaway was uh, how to make sure the people who are at the center of this have a bigger say in how decisions are made. And if you look at the couple of questions that have popped up uh, from the audience so far, and I do encourage others who are watching this to put their questions uh, in the chat uh, uh, if you have them. But uh, uh, the, the questions sort of go into this space as well. And I mean, this is an idea that's been around for a while. Everybody sort of agrees with the concept of this kind of thing you can't disagree with. Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, when you look back every five years as to how much we have succeeded in doing that, the answer is little, but not as much as we think we should have done or could have done. And I want to get a little bit of your sense of well, what holds up the implementation of this idea, this, this, this concept, which obviously everyone agrees with in principle. But what's your take on why, why it doesn't happen? Well, I think the, um, you know, the accountability relationship between the agencies and the people who finance them is always going to be a very strong relationship. I mean, the agencies can't do anything unless someone's willing to pay for it. So, um, uh, you know, um, I talked about one or two modest things we could do to provide some of that funding on a more predictable basis. But generally speaking, that relationship will always be a strong one. Um, and ironically, the more money is at stake, the, the stronger that, that bit of the relationship is. So I think what you need to do is introduce systematically some additional um, bits of the apparatus which cause both the agencies and those funding them, because as you say, both of them, those parties agree in principle that the voices of the victims ought to be heard more, that, that cause those voices to be heard more. So the, you know, the specific proposal I, I have made is that why don't we create some... Um, high-profile independent group whose, whose only job, whenever there's a crisis, is to go and ask the people affected, well, what is the help you most want? And then to track over time whether people get the help they ask for. But who are not providers of that help themselves. They, they, That's the crucial they, point. Yeah, yes. That's the crucial point. This has to be done by people who have no other skin in the game. Um, because otherwise it, it, it becomes relegated as an issue. That's one of the reasons it hasn't been taken up. People say, yes, yes, we'll do a bit of that. But, but over time, that core relationship between the financier and the agency overwhelms everything else going on again. So this needs to be independent and separate. Actually, I think that um, if the donors, the donors um, had enough kind of headspace and time to get their heads around it, they would quickly see why this was to their advantage, because there are some curious things happening as a result of the, the current way things are organized, like people get given commodities they don't want, sell them on ma markets, um, and whoever's done the procurement and paid for it has had lots of unnecessary expense as a result of that. It's also the case that um, the, the donors are very concerned and anxious about people in crises losing their ability to do anything from themselves, losing their agency, if you like, and being totally dependent. Because if you're in that position, it's very difficult in the future to recover your lives. And the agencies, the donors and the agencies would prefer these problems last a shorter period and people can move forward and recover. So there are, there are lots of reasons why it ought to be attractive to both the agencies and the donors to hear a bigger voice more consistently but unless but unless there's some separate independent entity that's forever banging on the door and causing it to happen you can see why the um why the drag the centrifugal forces if you like constantly pull it into a different direction and that's something that at the end of the day as you say ought to be attractive to donors 
who want to be sure that the funds that they're providing are getting the most impact uh, and they have less of a vested interest in maintaining the sort of bureaucratic machinery that is the intermediary currently between them and and the the ultimate uh, uh, recipients of of that uh, support um now i know you had that proposal for uh, about a, well it's now almost two years that uh, you set that out and i want to ask do you do you feel that there is some pick up on that do you think that there are prospects for people to pick that up as we move forward I mean, at the moment everyone is completely overwhelmed with just dealing with the day-to-day -day growing number of crises but uh, how do you feel about that now well you're right and and of course um ideally you would launch these kind of ideas in a slightly quieter period and uh, it's hard for people to raise their heads above the parapet when given all the issues they're dealing with now one of the curious features of the international humanitarian system is that it's subject to much, much less evaluation and external scrutiny and independent review than, for example, the international development system. And that's one of the reasons why it's been harder to um, make progress with these kinds of reforms in the humanitarian system than um, and, and have a continuous improvement mentality, if you like, than it has been in the the development system i think the development system is better at learning lessons and adjusting and i'm right. um, correcting um what's needed is um you know some entities who are willing to finance this kind of actually relatively cheap but discreet work on monitoring evaluation how to improve the system independent voice and all that kind of thing and um you know i i it seems to me uh, 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 something which um for foundations or the philanthropic space or the higher education sector is work that would have quite a high return actually and people could make quite a big difference so i am hopeful that um at some point there will be faster progress on it but you're right that um you know there's been limited progress in the yeah. last year or so for reasons which are understandable right. i suppose but i mean as you say i mean in a way it should be high return investment and and also I mean, the, the people, the countries that are financing humanitarian assistance, a relatively small number of countries account for a very large share of the total humanitarian assistance that is financed. So in some ways, it's, they are particularly uh, the one that would benefit from this uh, as well. Um, I want to maybe just, just be draw to a, a close to also ask you there's another set of issues which are around the kinds of the form in which assistance is provided so long debate between whether it's best done in cash or best done through uh, some provision of, of commodities and and I think that debate is sort of settling in in recognizing that there are clearly a space for both, but in many more instances, cash would be better. Uh, and yet, even on that front, I think that movement has been a bit slower than uh, people would want it to see. And uh, uh, maybe the the this agency or this, this capacity that you're talking about would also be a way of getting a much more direct view from the recipients of what they value. <laughs> Uh, as part of the driver of the support in each crisis. So where do you come out on, on this sort of cash and kind uh, discussion? Well, if you ask people, and I asked hundreds and hundreds of people in more than 50 countries, what what is it you need right now? And I was mostly talking to people in very extreme situations, you know, who, who were in um, in the middle of war zones or who like the rohingya who'd arrived in bangladesh had fled a campaign of ethnic cleansing um or parents of children in um syria who were watching their refugees being refugees being bombed basically if you ask people um well what is the help you need right now they always say two things the first thing they say is we need to be protected from this violence um, and the second thing they say is, um, 
give us money so we can solve our own problems. So you're right. If there was um, a more effective way of bringing those voices to the table, one of the consequences would be a faster acceleration in the greater use of cash mm. in humanitarian crises than has been uh, the case in the past. You know, it used to be um, controversial um, to say that giving money to poor people was a good idea. Won't they fecklessly spend it on the wrong things? And as a result of that, one of the most heavily scrutinized and evaluated areas of activity in the development system is these safety net programs, right. these cash transfer programs. And there's now a huge volume of quite consistent evidence, which basically shows if you give money to poor people, they, they always do three things. They buy food, they send their kids to school, and they invest in, in a um, some kind of income earning um, right. opportunity if they can. Um, and the same thing is what you find on, on the, the, the lesser number of similar evaluations and reviews that have been done in the humanitarian yeah. space. So it's a question of keeping pointing everybody at what the evidence shows, what people say they want, and, um, you know, um, banging, the, banging away on the drum. Oh. Mark, anything, any other points from the book that, that you wanted to mention? And I, and I just want to remind people, you know, here it is. And, and also to say, I, for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at it yet, I do encourage you to look at it because although the, the topic and the issues that this book deals with are, you know, often quite sobering, but actually sometimes a little bit dispiriting as well, I think that the, the book itself is a, a very easy read and it does actually talk quite frankly about both the nature of the problems, but also of the ways in which we could make a difference, even given the constraints, political and others, within which the humanitarian system has to operate. So I do highly recommend to people to have a, an opportunity to read through it. But, but before we leave, Mark, I want to sort of give you the last word and, and hear from you any thoughts. Well, I, I think the... The big takeaway really from the book is, as you just alluded to, the problems these agencies are dealing with are heartbreaking and tragic and sometimes overwhelming. But there's a lot that we can do to make it easier for them to do a good job for the most vulnerable people, targeting more women and girls, for example, doing things which um, increase the incentives for belligerence in conflict to um, pursue their agendas in a way consistent with the uh, laws of war. Lots of other totally achievable, um, quite cheap reforms that can be made to the system, which would have a huge impact on the lives of what, at the end of the day, are, are the world's most vulnerable people. These people caught up in these crises. There's no one more vulnerable um, across the whole planet uh, than them. And the, one of the things we know is the, the biggest step in improving the lives of a, you know, of very poor communities is the first one. There's a huge difference in in surviving on a dollar a day from being on two dollars or three dollars a day. So if we can focus on that most vulnerable group of people, that has a huge utility and welfare benefit um, for 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 mankind and society as a whole, as well as the fact that. Um, you know, if we don't um, deal with these problems where they start, what we find is they spread and spill over effects and it becomes a much bigger deal for all of us to have to navigate. Well said. That's uh, Sir Mark Lowcock, the author of Relief Chief. And uh, I want to thank you, Mark, for taking the time to, to share these uh, ideas with us. And I want to thank you also for having CGD be the place that was able to put out uh, this book uh, so we look forward to more comments on it. Thank you again. Thank you.